we talked about testing blood sugar. And an important piece we can bring into this is insulin resistance. And adding to that stack of tests we talked about before, fasting insulin, to catch your metabolic health starting to decline up to a decade or more even before you'd catch that if you were just looking at your fasting glucose. So talk more about that piece, the fact that insulin is going to be increased in the body over time, masking the effects of blood glucose. Yeah. So this gets into really like sort of the next layer of metabolic testing, which, you know, we talked about the first six or so tests in the very beginning of the episode, which I just feel like from an accessibility cost and importance value, like level, we should all know where we stand on those glucose, triglycerides, HDL, et cetera. But you're bringing up fasting insulin, which I, in the book, sort of say that's the next level. That is the most, I think that is the most important test we can each get for ourselves to understand our foundational health. Right now, I think it's, if we had one test to get, it would be that one. The reason it's not in my first six that I mentioned is because it's harder to get because a lot of doctors are just like, no, we're not going to order that for you. You're young and healthy. That's not done in standard practice, which is just one of the biggest problems in healthcare. So But if you can get it through a direct-to-consumer company, lab testing company, or your doctor will order it, get it. The reason is because of what you say. It can tell us about our level of metabolic dysfunction, insulin resistance, mitochondrial dysfunction, blood sugar dysfunction, all synonymous, a decade or more before those standard biomarkers are going to change. And so the reason for this is because when the body and the cells start to become dysfunctional from metabolic dysfunction, which is generally because our mitochondria, the cells that actually, or the part of the cell that actually makes energy and converts that glucose to energy, when those become damaged by our modern lifestyle. So the mitochondria can be damaged from so many different things, the toxins, the not moving enough, the not sleeping enough, the ultra processed food, any of those things that are hurting the mitochondria, basically stop it from being able to convert that glucose to energy effectively. And when that happens, the cell is going to be like, hey, the mitochondria is not working great, so we can't really take in more glucose to process to energy because the mitochondria is hurt by this modern environment we're living in. So it blocks glucose from coming into the cell, and it does that through insulin resistance. So the cell says, we're going to block the pathway that allows the insulin signal to come in and tell the glucose to basically be allowed into the cell because we can't process it. So you get insulin resistance because of the mitochondrial dysfunction. And then the body's like, yeah, okay, we understand that you can't take in the glucose, but we can't have this glucose just floating around in the bloodstream all the time because that's damaging too. So we're going to secrete more insulin to try and force the glucose into the cell. And that's essentially the high insulin levels that result from a problem inside the cell with mitochondrial dysfunction. So these insulin levels rise very early in this process, which are essentially a sign that the cell is overwhelmed and capacity is low to make energy. And it actually works for a while. That high insulin drives glucose into the cell. And so the blood glucose levels can look fairly normal for like a decade before the whole thing totally goes off the rails and the body can't overcompensate with high insulin levels anymore. And then you see both glucose and insulin levels high. So you basically step one is mitochondrial dysfunction. Step two is insulin resistance leading to high insulin levels, but glucose stays normal. And step three, far down the road of metabolic dysfunction is both insulin levels and glucose levels are high in the blood. So you want to catch this at level two, which is why you need to get a fasting insulin test. And in the book, I talk about how the range for fasting insulin that we really want to shoot for is about between like two and five, two and six milli IUs per milliliter. But what's crazy is that on the lab slip, it will often say that like less than 25 is normal for insulin. But when you actually look at the research, we want it to be much lower than that. If your insulin levels are already up to 25, that's actually a sign that your body's pushing out a lot of insulin, which may indicate essentially a problem with metabolic dysfunction already brewing. So we want that number low and tight. We want a low and healthy amount of insulin, which is a clear sign to us that our cells are not putting up an insulin resistant block. And so 
an example I give in the book that I think really illustrates this is like if you and I, Jesse, both went in and got our blood sugar taken and both of us came back with a blood sugar level of 85 milligrams per deciliter, both of our doctors would look at us in the eye and say, you're doing great. Your blood sugar is in a great range. Congratulations. And you go home. But if my insulin level, which wasn't checked, is 30 and yours is 2, we are basically very biologically different, but we don't know that because we didn't test the fasting insulin. So if my fasting insulin is 30, that means my body is having to pump out 30 milli IUs per milliliter of insulin to drive glucose into the cell to keep it at 85. But you're super metabolically healthy. Your body's only having to, having to churn out a small amount of insulin to keep that glucose at 85. So without this additional test, it's really hard to truly know where we stand now, just circling back to the beginning of the episode, let's say you're not able to get this test and your doctor's not going to order it for you. We can look at, in those biomarkers, the basic biomarkers we talked about, the triglycerides, HTL, waist circumference, blood pressure, fasting, glucose. What we'll often see with insulin resistance brewing is that triglycerides start to rise and HDL starts to go down and blood pressure starts to go up. So even if you don't have access to a fasting insulin test, if your triglycerides are creeping up, let's say your fasting insulin, let's say your fasting glucose, like we were just talking about, is 85, but you're like, oh, I really want to know if I'm on that early, if there's early dysfunction. Well, look at your triglycerides and HDL and blood pressure and waist circumference, because those are all going to give you a clue about how your insulin levels are as well. Because if insulin resistance is at play, our blood pressure goes up. If insulin resistance is at play, our triglycerides go up. So, um, so you can kind of squint and get a clue of this with those basic biomarkers, but what's best is to, um, to get a fasting insulin. And just in terms of ranges, I mentioned in the beginning of the episode that what the criteria says for quote unquote optimal triglycerides is less than 150 milligrams per deciliter. I would actually argue that we really want our triglycerides to be like more like 40, 50, 60, 70, like under 100, ideally. And so if your fasting glucose is 85 and your triglycerides are very low end of normal, so like 40s, 50s, 60s, that's a really good sign that your insulin levels are probably pretty low. So um, yeah, so that's kind of the overview of, of fasting insulin and, and uh, why it's so important. As you're sharing all that, it gets me curious if they were to add fasting insulin to those five tests we talked about early on, we're already talking about, again, that 93% range of people that are metabolically unhealthy. Imagine if we added that in and we're able to catch all these early cases, like I can only imagine what the number would be. It'd be so low. I think if the ranges were actually what they should be, so... And what I reported on this podcast was what the American College of Cardiology put in their paper. But if we actually looked at what all the research together shows for truly optimal levels, which in my, so they say fasting glucose less than hundred, I would say fasting glucose between 70 and 85. They say triglycerides less than 150. I'd say optimal is less than hundred. You know, they say HDL above 50 for women. I'd say we should be shooting for 60 to 90. So if we actually looked at optimal, optimal ranges, I bet that number would be 1% of people who are optimally metabolically healthy. And if we added fasting insulin, I think we'd be getting down to the 1% level, which is just a, a testament to how much our cells are struggling in this modern environment, you know, where everything about our lifestyle on every pillar has just changed so, so, so rapidly. This insulin resistance, this, this metabolic issue, it is literally the cells saying, we cannot handle the modern Western environment. It's not working. So it's it's pretty scary. It is. And you mentioned the fact that when we get to one end of the continuum, insulin's going to rise and blood glucose. That's when we're all the way at the end and we're type 2 diabetic. So we can look at this like insulin resistance is starting, pre-diabetes, diabetes, and unfortunately, conventional medicine is only going to catch things more than at the far end of that type 2 diabetes spectrum. Again, because the testing isn't done in a way to catch it early on. That's exactly right. Yeah. And I think 
in some ways, the system has kind of infantilized us as individuals saying like, oh, you know, this is complicated. You, you, it's hard to understand these lab tests. And and one of the big points, like one of the reasons I love podcasts like this and, and one of the points I really try and make in my work in the book is that it's actually not that complicated. It's pretty basic biochemistry. And I actually think that everyone, including teens, can like understand what we're talking about right now, you know, and like, you know, and it's like, we, we kind of have the responsibility now to understand 10, 15 biomarkers and what they actually mean about our cellular health, because we kind of just have to, like, it's like the system's not reading the tea leaves of our tests for us. The way our doctors, unfortunately, like, and I'm speaking as a doctor are trained is you see a list of lab results and they're either in the, they either, there's a, they're either red or green. It's like very algorithmic. This one's off. This one's not. This one's off. This one's not. And it's very much like, okay, if LDL is high, we need to bring LDL down, you know? And if glucose is high, we need to bring glucose down. And if magnesium is low, we need to bring magnesium up. And it's like very kind of robotic. And like what I really, the vision I have for how we would train doctors is like, how do you look at all of these together as a reading the tea leaves of, it's a tapestry of biomarkers that can tell us about how the cell is doing, which is ultimately all we care about. How is the cell doing? How can we make the cell happier? Because if the cells are happy in our body, we're healthy. And I think that every single person, basically high school biology or above, can understand that. And so that's that's really the message that I want to empower people with is like, we got to understand these basic biomarkers for ourselves and then track them every few months until they're in the right range. And they can change rapidly. You know, I've seen triglycerides drop 100 points in two months. I've seen glucose drop 30 points in two months. Simple, simple diet and lifestyle changes that improve mitochondrial health will improve almost all of these biomarkers. If you enjoyed that clip, you're going to want to head over here and catch a full episode. I'll see you over there. Everyone needs to care about this because metabolism and metabolic health, it is the core foundational layer that all health is built upon. That is the biggest blind spot in Western healthcare.